pleasure to be with all of you. Some people from the poll, from the Center of World Catholicism, from uh, CTU, from St. Clement Parish, from different places. Uh, I wish to, to start with uh, some narratives and later to focus on what some people are calling a, a new paradigm or new paradigms in Latin American and Caribbean uh, ways of doing uh, theology. And my last section is on an effort to share some things on how uh, God and the Spirit of God is understood uh, in, uh, in reference to these uh, paradigms of these ways of uh, approaching the, the mystery of, of our faith. Um, since we are in Easter time, I think sometimes one can feel, and I sometimes feel that way, that just like Thomas, I would like to touch the wounds and be more in solidarity with humanity that is uh, suffering and that is also is not on. I have to shout. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, and one wishes that there be uh, an end to uh, so many um, groups of people that are crucified. And one wishes that they could be brought down from the cross. Um, one thinks of today's world, uh, there's an ex Oxfam study that says that there's 85 persons, and none which are already here, the required persons that have as much wealth as three and a half billion persons in today's world. So it's a drama of concrete individuals, but it's a drama of our whole universe of humanity today. And my uh, brief narratives are the following. Juan Alcina, a priest whom I knew in Santiago, told the military minutes before being killed at the edge of a river. He told the one who was pointing the gun towards him, please do not blindfold me because I want to see you and give you forgiveness. After this, and after many other horrible events, Chilean society took 30 years to publicly acknowledge widespread torture. Alcina, this priest, diocesan priest, and others were the ones who gave the first steps towards reconciliation. Second narrative, I recently heard Rigoberta Menchu from Guatemala referring to uh, the violence in Guatemala where some say 200,000 people were killed in internal war, and she spoke how sons and daughters of the victims took their place and gave forgiveness because those who had done all these violence were not able to ask forgiveness. And she was telling us someone had to take that role, and it was the, the ones who had been killed, the daughters and Sons went, who took the role of those who had shot their own relatives and asked for, for, for forgiveness.
my last part is brief. And I attempt to do what sometimes I tell communities among which I work, and students in the university where I teach. It is so difficult to, to speak of relationships that engage ourselves with God. Um, but if we do it, starting from the from the bottom up to say something, from bonds and, and, and relationships that one experiences in everyday life, uh, between younger generations and older people, between urban and rural people, between men and women, if, between us and entities around us in, the, in, the, in creation. It seems to me that thus we can have images of God, more powerful images of God, as a co-relational trinity. Because that seems to be the nature of God. Not a lonely being, but a co-relational being. As we all know, the narratives of Genesis, the narratives of creation, link us to all living creatures and to God that declares that everything is good. And we're also very much aware about evangelical gospel narratives that have love as the key to everything. Love is a way of speaking of relationships without boundaries. Thus, listening and carrying out God's word today implies being in relationships, and these are subversive in terms of dominant powers in today's world. And there are also humble contributions that we as believers, as Christians and Catholics, can uh, offer to civilization or change, or cambio de epoca, as it's sometimes said. This is the last page, so I will Christian experience may be seen as a specific gateway in this universal di direction. These are big words. In the, in this direct, major direction. It is symbolized in celebration through concrete signs, through sharing of wisdom, through tenderness, through courage. They will, daily table fellowship, I think, is a major sign and also water and oil in the beginning of our personal journeys in faith, caring for each other and being reconciled, sexual and family interaction, ministry in all its dimensions, Eucharistic bread and wine. Instead of an inward focus of this basic human and theological realities, we enjoy an outward focus, outgoing relational relationships. The universe is a network of bonds. Within this marvelous universe, humanity engages in a journey of millions of years. What happens with Christian tradition? The triune God manifested in Jesus Christ and the spirit of love may be described as relation of relationships, relación de relaciones. In Latin American theological discourse, this relational paradigm is being developed, even though this term is not used very often as such. But what is important is the content of the kind of reflection that is being carried out. It draws its meaning from everyday experience of being with others. Convivir con otros y otras. Convivir means overcoming violence that places one against them. And implies also being empowered from below, not from levels of power, from below. Its unfathomable source is what we call a triune God, praised and worshipped by all the universe and manifested 
in our kenotic Pascal mystery, or experience of that kenotic Pascal mystery. My general conclusion is that healing of wounds and empowerment belong to consumer theology. So this is not just a thing of the region of the world, South America and others. It is part of our major tradition as church in the world today. With this effort to read the signs of the times. This favors contemporary solidarity with the downtrodden. It also critically examines desires in consumer global society. And it confronts a historical pride when pride is not historical or academic life when it tries to be neutral. All of this implies a spiritual theology that heals the wounded and removes them from the cross. Thus, humanity is empowered and celebrates life. I would very much like to listen and to interact and to do. Um, there's so many things that can be said about this and other things. But there's persons here that come from different ways of life. Some from Washington, some from South Bend, some from here, some from other places, from Greece, and from Chicago, which is important. So, um, <coughs> what, uh, of course, you can comment anything I try to share with you, or you can present other concerns, other elements that you want to bring up. Uh, Diego, um, my question, yeah, each one that speaks can come here or speak loudly from where you are. It's a troubling idea. So I, I, I just wonder if you could speak um, of a little bit more about what you mean by that. Um, perhaps you mean it's not neutral at all. And um, and then let's say people, people academics in in, in, in our, my context, in, the, in this context, uh, what is the path to overcoming that, in your view? Well, I will begin speaking of personal experiences. Yeah. As other people have uh, encountered this in different parts of the world and also in the continent. Um, when one begins to underline certain interpretations, one is told, no, you have to be more balanced. You cannot just uh, deal with that point of view. You have to incorporate all the other points of view and kind of make a summary and put all together and, uh, and you will find equilibrium. Um, I think uh, the world of today and uh, los clamores del pobre, the cries of the poor, and especially hunger and sickness, which are so much pressing everywhere in the world, in other parts, in some parts more than um, move us to say, well, how can I be responsible in thinking and responsible to what is needed today, which is not just being in the middle, which means uh, courageous thinking. And I, I think critical uh, thought, Western critical thought is most important in allowing us to, to take a distance from one's own perspective and from other perspectives, and not just to follow a partisan dogmatic point of view. <laughs> but critical thinking, it seems to me, has to go in hand in hand with um, putting our net out and, <laughs> and take risks. Um, I can speak loudly, okay? Um, my question. 
Uh, you mentioned the, the diminishing of women and youth in your church, or perhaps in your country. And since it's been identified, what processes are you going to think about to bring them back into the fold? Well, right now in, in Latin America as well, the continent and Chile, so we are in a missionary uh, perspective as the Aparecida, uh, meeting of all the other generations. And a key element in that is that youth are missionaries to the youth. And those of us who are not so young, like in my case, we just allow other voices. And um, and I also I'm strongly convinced that um, the wisdom shared by women and the way they organize life from the very concrete details of everyday life to social uh, major um, dimensions. And I think um, so I'm doing some effort, small, together with others, so that protagonists of the missionary church be young people and women. But not because we give them the job to do that we want them to do, but because they discover and develop their own potentialities and their own But it also, I think, creates a question, particularly coming from the academic context of um, a logic uh, that could then be brought into interface with, say, historical criticism or onto theology. And I wonder if you had ideas about resources, this is kind of the epistemological underpinnings of una teoria apasionada. Well, there's a friend in Ecuador that uh, is talking a lot about una sabiduría cordial, y un conocimiento cordial, cordial knowledge, knowledge from the heart, I say, which is not in opposition to knowledge from the mind, but it's more holistic. Um, I've enjoyed for many, many years uh, indigenous thinking and rituals and theologies, <coughs> which uh, this relates to the other thing of uh, the uh, um, that have limitations like any kind of human production. But, um, and I sometimes compare what happens in those experiences and what happens to me when I go to to universities or to church meetings. Uh, the importance of, of, of music, of dancing, and of sharing food, and, and of prayer, and of contemplation. I was recently in a major event in, in Central America, and the best talk was given by a Mexican theologian, Estizo. Um, and his talk was uh, language, but there was a lot of science. And throughout, systematically, like in 15 or 20 moments of his talk, that lasted about an hour, he would stop speaking and he would ask someone from the audience to, to take some, some element that was in the, in the center of the room and, and make an offering with words or with science. But I, I thought that was fantastic. It was a contemplative and very deep you know, effort to understand and to and to open one's mind and heart to the one who embraces all of us. Because if theology is just an effort to convince each other or to explain things, and it doesn't incorporate dimensions of prayer and of silence and of, the, and of music and other help, then it's, uh, it's very limited. 
I, I normally don't, uh, this is not a principal concern of mine, but I want to raise this because I think it's an important concern in the American church, in our North American church. This past Sunday, I went to an ordination of deacons. They were Mexican, Spanish members, mostly. But I had a reaction as, as a North American, I mean, this, that I think many, many, many young women have, which is how will the church truly reach young people when it is so masculine in its representation of itself? That is, that it's almost impossible to, to get beyond that for many women now. They see the church as a, a, a sort of a last stand of masculine domination. There were no women on the altar, and there, there wouldn't be. So, and I know young people in my family, for example, young women who are doctors, lawyers, etc. They don't understand this. They they can't get past it. So, in terms of relationality and compassion, etc., how can the church itself? You know, I mean, you mentioned institutional suicide, but this is a big concern of mine. And I don't know whether it's true in Latin America in the same way it is in the United States, but I know it's a huge concern among young adults who are the future. Yeah. So, well, I, I was wondering how you would fit this into your thinking about since, it. Uh, <clears throat> since you roots are connected to Maya people and yes. people in Mexico. Um, or they ordain the deacon with the wives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Samuel Ruiz had to explain that he well, no, really, I understand. Yes. really ordained the women, but they were standing next to their husband in the moment of the nation. Right. And that meant that the Curia did not allow any more ordinations of deacons for a long time. Mm -hmm. But the present bishop has already obtained permission to continue the right. of deacons, uh, deacons, permanent deacons. But the thing, I, I, I make a reference to the major reality. One goes, and I've been you know, someplace in, in Central America, and in Holy Week, the way Maya people crowd into their churches and establish and families, they, they take over the, 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 the temple, the, the, the church the place. And, and the rituals are done by different families. It is not one who presides on the altar. It is families that celebrate uh, very particularly when they remember the, the, the first and second of November, but also in other moments. So the churches are transformed. Well, I think we need that. We need that. In each place, there are different conditions. But that uh, that we, we allow families and, and lay people to to take over our, our spaces. You know, one of the things that, that was very uh, touching and intriguing, what you shared, was uh, for me, you know, this message of forgiveness, and where you have liberation theology, you have acts of, uh, prior, you know, acts of violence, acts of disrespect, great disrespect, disrespect for other people. Um, I was wondering if you could touch a little bit more on, on this may be the role uh, of just that theme of forgiveness in liberation. Well, the, the authors that have dedicated uh, people working in sacramental theology and other areas that have worked on. But, um, no, I would <coughs> underline uh, liberation theology sometimes seen as a thing of books and famous authors. Liberation theology mainly has grown through the reading of the word. Comunidades de la Palabra. Biblical uh, grassroots experiences. And those are the most important uh, spaces for uh, development of liberation theology. Uh, and they're waste and they're all over and there are thousands and thousands and, 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 and lay people are the leaders of that. And I I participate in some local basic community community Cristiana de Basi. And um, I remember for example one situation of a woman 
um, whose uh, husband had been uh, unfaithful to her, and he shared that in, in the community. He spoke about that. Uh, I knew her for a couple of years, but I, I, I never was aware of that situation. But she opened her heart, and, and the way the community um, listened, and then there were very significant uh, things happening. Those who approached her, embraced her, cried with her. She, she was crying, and other people were crying together with her. And they were forgiving her in a way, not saying it. many times the word itself, forgiveness. But um, I think that's, I think you know, most of us must be aware of things like that happen. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, those of us who do liberation theology were seen as uh, militants for, of the revolution and not for forgiveness. You know? We want to, you know, to, to even shoot people. Some people have claimed that this is a guerrilla type of, of, of doing, the way of doing theology, which is not true. Um, at times, there have been languages that are a little bit close to a justification of violence, of revolutionary violence. And that's very problematic. Uh, because most of us are more in the line of, of persistent resistance, non-violent resistance to forms of justice. And I suppose my question comes more in relation to within the church itself and the collusion that the church has and had in the experiences of violence both in Latin America and beyond. And when people's experiences of such violence, especially in the continent as a whole, and in the search for reconciliation and the problematic uh, challenges that are in reconciling um, the histories in many parts of the continent um, and the disparities within the church still in relation to that. It's where do you see this thing of healing wounds and empowerment both for the institution within itself and in accompanying the people in that true search for both empowerment and the healing of wounds that in order for us to have a more liberating um, experience of God as a whole, both in countries and in the continent, you know, that has been very much marked. By well, you're referring to a very painful thing that uh, in Argentina, in Chile, and in other parts, uh, voices of the hierarchy, not all of them, significant voices, and activities of military chaplains were very much part of military dictatorships. And that was, um, and it's taken us a long, many years to acknowledge that. And it's been acknowledged in places like Argentina and Argentina and other places. But I myself feel that the, 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 the greatest violence we do, I don't know if this is acceptable to those of you who are here, but is the way we distort images of God. And we, um, we present particular meanings of what is sacred or what God wishes for humanity in very limited terms. And I think not being faithful to uh, an unfathomable, un Dios inagotable, misterioso, who cannot be and close up in, in some of the categories we use. And that's part of my difficulty with uh, some neoliberal and neoscholastic trends around me. Uh, and also within me, I, <coughs> I have the problem inside. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no. Even though usually it's done with good intention, you know, we want to share our faith, the content of our faith, but if the imagery we employ is um, discriminatory to persons, 
and it, I think it's very discriminatory with young people and with women, especially, and with indigenous peoples. That's a problem of 500 years. That's why I'm, I'm a fervent devotee of our version of what I would be. Chi and Pan Diego were able to make a breakthrough there in colonial Christianity. Yes, yes. And thank you very much, Diego, for your presentation. So a little bit of background on, on this question. Diego and I had lunch yesterday, and we were talking a little bit about some of the issues you're raising. You were talking about, um, about Carlos Canone mm -hmm. and the distinction that he makes between these two strains of liberation thought, one the social, political, and the other the cultural. And I know that you're very indebted to his work, you're friends with him, but I know that you also would like to nuance that a little bit more than he does. And I got home yesterday thinking, Gosh, I wish I would have asked him more about this to see how exactly he does nuance this distinction. What I heard you do in your talk today is to bring up those two points, and it seemed to me that you moved from those two points straight to the idea of the relational theology. So I'm wondering if you can just say a little bit more about the relationship between this, these, these categories, the social and political and the cultural, and this third category, the relational. Does this bring those two categories together for you? Does it alter the terms of the debate altogether? How do we understand these, these two strains that Scanone had, yeah. had pointed to yeah. in the first place? The previous small thing uh, with categories, uh, because I think we're all aware that what's the basic basics are being faithful and not the way we interpret what we experience. But then when we interpret and we give uh, an, uh, an explanation in terms of categories like what is social, social economic or the culture or the relation or whatever it is, um, I think there are approximations. It's an effort to, and you mentioned Scanone and Lucio Jera and others very important and were very influential in the thinking of Pope Francis, by the way. These are Argentinian uh, theologians and philosophers, and Rafael Calle and others from there. <laughs> <Today they. laughs> Two professores. Mira, que bien. So we have that student there. This person, well, it seems to me that. Um, they were able to formulate in a period in which the Argentina society was going through terrible turmoil to something that Scanoni has been calling Teología del Pueblo. And he sometimes makes a difference <coughs> with Teología de la Liberación, Liberation Theology. Now, uh, one of the in moments I've been with Scanoni, different moments, was in Leuven, in Belgium, where uh, Europeans tried to force it. I thought it was difficult because they, they were telling us, look, you've shifted. You've gone from the social to the cultural. And let's recognize that. Latin American theology has left its original thrust and has gone into another direction. And, um, and on that situation, Scanoni gave a public witness, he said, with Gustavo Gutierrez, we've spoken about these things several times, and they could be seen as two strands, which are different. It's not the same, exactly the same kind of understanding of it. But it is not that uh, being close to cultural dimensions and, and affective, or affective, or cultural, or artistic, that that draws it away from uh, social political concerns. However, at times, both social political concerns and cultural concerns become quite unilater unilateral. You know, they, they, they underline certain phenomena and don't take into account other phenomena. Part of my life experience was when I had to leave Chile, because it was not a volunteer, I was uh, 
even a scholarship of a PhD. Uh, I was invited to Peru exactly to work on popular culture and popular religion. And that's what I did with Gustavo Gutierrez and his team. And this was in the 70s. So it's not that now we've shifted to now. This is, has been happening for a long time. But these are only efforts, human efforts, with limitations. And I think what is happening now, the emergent ways of thinking are most important. And we don't have to just be always be, um, take into consideration the, the, the basic uh, constructions that have been placed in our one can call the building of Latin American thinking. <coughs> new construction blocks and new visions and new dimensions are and, and, and when some people tell me, no, no, your kind of theology is something of the 60s or the 70s, you know, it has, hasn't any meaning anymore. Well, if one reads Spanish, or if one reads, there's not too much in English, but the literature is abundant. And, um, and there's a lot of creativity in the Caribbean and in, in, in South and North and uh, Central and South America, but also in the Caribbean. Yeah. If anyone is tired, please go to the food there and, and the door is over there. Do you, <laughs> do, you, do you see a shift in the acceptance of these premises? Under the new pope, under both places. Well, with, uh, <coughs> with Benedict, we have a lot of books mm -hmm. in, in Latin American theological circles. And it was not a problem with Sabina and what it was a problem with. I think one has to be open to crit criticism and to you know, change or explain things that are insufficient. And, but I think certainly with Pope Francis, it's a spring time. <laughs> and, um, and we feel very, very relieved, very encouraged. Yeah. Things in the past were Difficulties continue in the first pressure. And the, the thing is, is, is pluralism in terms of the theological community. That, that, that we accept pluralism. But that's not so easy because certain ways of thinking are certain that they have the right direction and that others are deviants and are, are going away from the right path. Um, as Pope Francis says, the only certainty of dogma that we have is that God loves us. He has very strong expressions. La única certeza dogmática es que Dios nos ama. Why? with which we could interact, listen, and allow them to 
come forth with their own perspectives of how is a disabled God. God is fragile. Well, not God itself, exactly. I mean, persons who, where we find Christ, are, have disabilities, are fragile, are what? And, and they're moving. This thing of, of migration and movements, there's uh, very good work being done in some areas in our church and in theology too. But, um, but I think having a, a, a nomadic faith, being nomads in the faith, um, and, and I'm recognizing that we move from different images of the sacred and of God. And, and our communities of, of worship also are different. One go from one part to another. To reflect on that and to, to allow migrants to reconstruct, and I did some of that together with others in Peru. There's a lot of migration inside of Peru. And, um, and part of it was allowing migrants to not just remember their previous Catholic heritage, which they were able to do, and the saints that they had devotions to and celebrate the feasts and all that, but to open their, themselves to a, another context in which they are together with people who have other beliefs, other rituals, other devotions, other images of Mary and of the saints and all that. That's a great challenge. And Challenges are like that in other areas. And so, if you and other young people are working in those themes, I think that's more, more important than having old and cranky theologians like me <laughs> doing work. That's most important. Diego, could you talk a little bit about the, um, the post dictatorship period in Chile with regard to this theme of forgiveness. I mean, certainly um, this would be a controversial idea. There's a lot of people that hear forgiveness and they hear that as, you know, wiping out the past, not dealing with the past, not doing justice. Um, how do you bring forgiveness and justice together in that kind of context? I'm, many of us have heard what has been repeated in Guatemala, nunca más, Girardi and Bishop was assassinated. You know, partly because he headed the commission that came up with that. Never, never more, ne never again, widespread torsion and, and, and violation of human rights and all that. I think that's the beginning, that's the first step that has to be. A society, a community, and us to be a church, have to honestly not only say that, but act in such a way that none commands things like that happen because that is provoked by people. Now, the thing of, um, that's why the, the, what Rigoberta Benchu, because Rigoberta Benchu said that in a torture center that was 10 blocks away from my house. I live very close to a very important torture center in Chile. We never knew it was a torture center. Because what? But um, and you were talking to should visit that place, Villa Livaldi, and, and and she came up with this thing of um, if forgiveness is not done by people that, that could do it and should do it, then someone has to do it. And I think that's a very important prophetic role in, in the church. We have to ask forgiveness and say nunca más to sexual abuse and to other things, but also move them as to social economic realities that include violence and violation of human rights. And that's, um, there are some places in, in the world that this has been done. Um, but then the thing of forgetting, because one of the debates is, do we have to forget what happened? just, you know, turn the page, you know, go, go in, in another, um, 
time is going to my mind, but I, uh, the, the thing is, because some of the victims of human rights insist that they're, they're not going to forget, and they're not going to give easy forgiveness. They, they are, are open to forgiveness if there are signs that uh, this uh, cruelty is acknowledged. So to speak out, people will speak out of that. So for example, in Chile, that, that's important torture is most important. And that was, uh, uh, it took 30 years to do that, a long, long time. 30 years after all the torture happened, they came out with that report. And unfortunately, the, 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 the government was unable to, to include in the report the names of the torturers because the names were there. Not all the names, because many times they are blindfolded and they don't know who's hitting them, but, but there were many names. But those didn't come out in public, came out through uh, other means of But uh, no, the thing of forgetting, not forgetting, putting an end to systematic violence and, and committing oneself to that, and also being aware that every human being is part of a major social sin. So it's not just the tortures, it's complicity with silence or not, not doing something. So it's the, the task of forgiving ourselves and acknowledging that we are part of the problem too, not just those who are accusing others you know, of doing all those things. I wonder if we will be coming to an end. What do you say, Karen? You're the head of this. <laughs> Uh, it's up to you. We have time for another question if anyone uh, wants to. Well, before we thank Diego, I do want to thank uh, the staff of the center, Garrett uh, Johnson, Karen Kraft, uh, Francis Salinel, who did all the hard work in putting this uh, together. But um, uh, we especially want to thank our guest, uh, Diego, for a uh, I, I, I thank you for your patience, your participation, your questions, your look, the look in your eyes. If you, in fact, I can share this with you, I'm very, very thankful. Thank you.